chance to watch Canary. What a, what a story and having Lonnie at the same time tell his own story, which must be one of those fascinating experiences when you're making a documentary. Yeah, I mean, he's lived an extraordinary life. Like Lonnie has, you know, pretty much seen the entire world and he's seen it through these scientific expeditions to the world's tallest mountains and not only in you know doing his science to find ice cores that give us important information about climate change but he's kind of like this indiana jones like character who everywhere he goes there's a mountain he wants to get on top of it to do his science but he's got to figure out how am I going to do it? How am I going to get there? And every one of his 65 expeditions is an adventure in its own right. Can you explain the title of Canary, where it came from? So Canary refers to, um, in, in back in when a lot of people were doing coal mining, uh, coal mines are inherently unsafe places to work. And one of the tricks that coal miners would use is they'd bring a little cage uh, into the mine with them and the with a canary in it, a live bird canary. And uh, the canary is the most vulnerable creature in, in that place. And they keep an eye on the canary. And if, if the air quality changed significantly, the canary would be the first to show the signs of distress and or would, would die first. And in, in those cases where you see the canaries distressed, you know you need to do something else. You need to move. You need to get out. Um, and so given that Lonnie is from coal country, uh, you know, is destined to work in the coal mines, uh, given that he has, he then draws the analogy to how the glaciers are the canary, where they are the ones showing the first signs of distress uh, and, and giving us this warning that we need to do something else. And so we just, we felt like it was a natural title that kind of fit not only with Lonnie's story, but uh, as an analogy, a metaphor to, to talk about the fact that there is something on this planet that is giving us a message that we need to listen to, just like the canaries in the coal mine. Yeah, and to just further that, you know, he calls these glaciers the canary in the coal mine because in the issue of global warming, these ones were the first to start melting. And he saw that all the way back in 1991. And he became the person warning the world about climate change and well ahead of the curve. We hear about it every day now, but he was one of those first scientists going to the Senate, trying to get people to pay attention because he saw the canary dying. It's this whole full circle about how, you know, things have been working. And then you you also stress about how the industrial revolution and fossil fuel burning is what's causing this. And in a way, do you think in a metaphor, we're kind of like the canary of the earth as the humans, how we're, we're doing all this. And at the end, it's, it's affect, it is affecting us um, health wise. And even going to people like you have in Peru that you talk about how some people may become environmental refugees in the future. I, I think that's pretty true. And you often hear stories about people saying, I didn't really care about climate change until my house burned down in a wildfire. I didn't think about it much until this. I mean, I've seen talks where like these millionaires are like, yeah, I just made my money. I didn't really think about it. And then my Malibu mansion burned down and now I'm focused on it. Almost like uh, you hear about scientists who, who see a shark and they get scared but fascinated by it and they make it their mission to study it it's it's kind of this thing that it's touching all of our lives in different ways and we're starting to feel like the heat in a way you are both co-directors of canary how did you split the work because there was so much footage it was a lot I think the the best way that we didn't really split the work we just leaned into each other's talents um you know, one of the things that, so I come from a very different background. I, I came from a science background. I did a PhD and postdoc in neuroscience at MIT, and then switched over to work with Danny on this project and other projects in the world of, of science. 
And what we found is that we kind of needed each other for this project. You know, I there were times when I could communicate well with the groups of scientists about what we were trying to accomplish. There were times where I needed to help push through tough times. And then there was lots of stuff where Danny needed to help push me through, you know, understanding how to think about story, how to think about uh, directing a film, how to think about what we need and making sure that we get it. So we just kind of, we didn't think about splitting. We just would pretty much wake up every day. The first call of the day would be to each other. What do we need to do? What do we need to figure out? Um, and just kind of work on each other's to help push each other, you know, and, and these endeavors where you're taking this much footage from around the planet, where you're climbing up to 18,000 feet, trying to keep a, a, a crew safe and productive. You really need people that look out for your safety, look out for your back and also fill in the gaps that you have. And I think Danny and I complement each other so well uh, at all those levels. And, and through this process, as much as we've kind of pushed each other and 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 bent each other we we see how well we work together and so we've started a production company you know with together and with the the other producer on the film adam paul smith because we all see that kind of you can make incredible things when you work together and push each other on these on these lines which going back to is the lesson that we learned from seeing lonnie accomplish what he did is pulling together teams of people who could complement each other um they didn't split the work but they all helped when and where they were needed. And uh, so that, that's that's just kind of how we approach things. Yeah, I think also just um, all movies are like that. Uh, we just happen to be sharing the director title, but anything you do that's a big project requires a ton of people. And if you took any one person and had them try to make the film, it would never happen. So. Alex was one of the first people on the project that made this possible. But, you know, there's hundreds of people who helped along the way. And, you know, we all split the work in a way. I have uh, footage from an end of the road production. Can you talk a little bit about that and why integrating that one? Well, that is our production company that we started. And we named it after Lonnie because he in his expeditions to the mountain he went to Qualkaya, this the world's largest tropical glacier to drill ice cores back in the 70s and everyone told him it was crazy you can't go that high it'll never work um you know those environments are places where people's brains expand and they die mountain climbers go up there for one day but he wanted to go up there and live up there for weeks and to everyone, it was a bad idea, but he got to the end of the road and even the people there said, if you go past this point, we can't help you. That's where the robbers and the murderers are. And he went anyway, and he brought back these records that were really important. And that's what making this film felt like is, you know, I work on the show Chef's Table and people said, you can't do what we do on chef's table on top of a mountain. You can't take that size of a crew, those kind of cameras. Like you don't even know if the cameras will work. And we did it anyway. And we figured out how to make it happen. And our hope with the production company is to take films, either our own films or films that other people have that are great ideas where maybe people don't see it and helping them forge the path off of the end of the road because you know that's where the real discoveries are that's where the real creative work gets done and that's where the new things come from and we've learned how to survive out there where you know you don't have the support you would have if you made like a celebrity driven doc or something that uh you know is more like the city doc we're out going on the adventure to the unknown with filmmakers to find the best stories there are to tell. It was interesting when you guys talk about the solar power and how back at, you know, National Science Foundation doubted the future of solar power. So can you tell me about integrating this kind of information that, I mean, that's something interesting that I learned. Yeah, I think what it is is just, you know, Lonnie 
tried to bring the six ton drill up the mountain, but it was too heavy because the gas generators were too heavy. So basically they had to invent something that hadn't been invented before to solve their problem, which was making a solar power drill. And because of that, it was lighter, it could be broken down in pieces and they could take it up the mountain on 40 horses and then carry it themselves the rest of the way. And, you know, it's that sort of thing when people say that this is impossible in solving climate change, they're doing it with their understanding of the world now. They're not doing it understanding the potential of all these new ideas the hard work it takes to get there. And Lonnie's first expeditions to Qualkaya kind of give a roadmap of how to solve big problems like climate change. And it's about committing to the goal, painting a dream, and getting smart people on board with that dream. And along the way, you figure it out. And it's not smooth. Like people are keep waiting for the perfect climate change answer but there's thousands of solutions out there and a lot of smart people working on them. And we just need to commit to, you know, taking the world into our new future where we don't depend on fossil fuels and it's going to be an adventure getting there. And there's going to be ups and downs and dead ends and breakthroughs and all these things. But if we're not moving forward, it'll never happen. So one of the things I like about you pointing out the solar panels is that, you know, like Danny said, it was, they couldn't get the generators up the, to 19,000 feet. And, you know, because of the, the, the weight of these things and the fossil fuels, and it took solar panels to, to help solve that problem. And it, the parallel with a lot of things that are happening today in terms of where we get our energy is, is, is pretty obvious, right? That, you know, we need to move away from these clunky, dirty things and solar panels are part of that answer. So it's just, you know, it's, it's a foreshadowing of, of kind of where we are today in, in, a, in kind of a cool way. Yeah, you're bringing so much knowledge in the documentary, not only the story of Lonnie. So how did you how did you manage to stay in that line of focusing on the glaciers and global warming and Lonnie? Um, well, the way I try and do it is actually there's a a book called The Art of Dramatic Writing. And they, it was written a long time ago and it's a little dated, but they talked about exposition and information should never be in a film or in a story like just shoveled in there. And the way you wanna do it is find a place where you get the information, but while the story's moving forward. so. We tried to minimize, you know, those scenes in movies where people explain, now this is this, this is how it works. And we tried to make, only include information that heightened the stakes of the story or was born out of the conflict in the story. Because we could have talked about a million things of Lonnie's career, a million expeditions, um, even his childhood is basically the movie October Sky. Like there's so much richness in his life that we had to really take a step back and think what was serving this larger story and focus the information around that. What does Lonnie say about this documentary? He's seen it? Yes, he's seen it. He, he has times. seen it and he he's expressed a lot of uh, appreciation for it he has said many times that he couldn't imagine you know anyone else t taking his story and, and doing justice with it um and you know he is today the, the film opens today in la new york and in columbus ohio and lonnie is going to the first screening in columbus ohio and uh he has invited the family of the um the, the the man who gave Lonnie his heart when he passed away to the screening. And I think that is a symbol of how much this movie means to Lonnie and, and how proud he is of it. And, um, you know, I think it's just wonderful that he gets to share this moment with them uh, because it, their lives are so intertwined and in, 
you know, have, have built upon each other in a way. And, you know, I, I think that tells you what Lonnie thinks of the, of the film, uh, is that he is, he's willing and, and able to share it with the people who have given him the most. Yvonne, right? Evan. Yeah. Evan. Evan. Yeah. Evan, right? Yeah. Go ahead. It was interesting the circle of how, thanks to having all this science and technology, thanks to some of these harming items, that Lonnie has been like, this is not good. Yet, also helped him, also to continue and have a heart, a new heart. In terms of his his kind of uh, when he had the 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 heart pump that was powered by coal. Yeah, I mean, we we wanted to say that because our as a species and as a society, we have such a interesting relationship with fossil fuels and coal, right? It has it has allowed us to do amazing things. It allowed us to dream. It has, has given people employment. It has opened up industries and changed our imagination. You know, the, it has kept Lonnie alive, right? Just the mere fact that he was plugged into the wall that was, was powered by coal. Um, and it is the thing that is harming us the most, right? And I, I just, there is, it is, it's one of those things that we need to look at honestly. We need to understand how we got where we got, and we need to understand how we get where we need to be. Um, and, you know, humans are just, we're not very good at that. <laughs> uh, we, we like, we respond well when the fire is at our house. We don't respond well when the fire is two houses down. Um, and so part of making this film is to try to give people a different perspective on on how to think about their own denial. I mean, the fact that Lonnie was the world expert telling the world, listen to the facts on climate change. And then so doctor said, you have a, a congestive heart failure. You need a heart transplant. And he didn't listen to his doctor. He went into denial, shows you the susceptibility that even the world's experts have to denial. And it's one of the most beautiful things in Lonnie's story I, that he opened up about, you know, is, is that I think adds a dimension to this film that forces audiences and and myself and Danny, I know, to think about the things that we are in denial about, to think about our own hypocrisies uh, and and to try to, to pave a path forward. Well, the glacier Indiana Jones is human after all. <laughs> exactly. Well, thank you so much for your time. Uh, congratulations with this documentary. Like I said, thank you. you opened up a lot of my a little bit of knowledge and more curious to learn about. So I will try to uh, do my part. Thank you so much. And, and, you know, I think that if the film can, you know, allow you to, you know, force everyone to think a little bit about how we could make this planet a little bit better for the next generation, for, for our kids and our grandkids, but also for a lot of the vulnerable people on the planet now, which, uh, you know, as the film talks about our, are the vulnerable communities, like the indigenous communities at the base of these glaciers. Um, you know, we, we need to think about them now and, and, and care about them now. And so uh, the more people who could see this movie, I hope the, the more kind of the, the goodness of what's in it and the inspiration can spread. And so we are open now in theaters today in LA, um, New York, and in Columbus, Ohio. And on September 20th, Beyond my wildest imagination, we are opening in 150 screens across the uh, the U.S. Uh, for a one-time kind of showing, um, and it's been fun to watch that unravel. So, you know, looking for you can find where and to see it at canary.oscilloscope.net. Um, and you know, thank you for supporting science on the big screen, and and I hope this this film can can change your perspective. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you again. Thank you so yes, much. Thanks. It was wonderful to thanks talk to you. Thanks for your great questions. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate it. Bye-bye. <laughs>